Hi, I'm Stephen Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office. Tonight, I am so honored to have my adopted British brother from another mother. He's a phenomenal storyboard artist, concept artist, creature creator. He's worked on films like Rise of the Planet of the Apes, the TV series Loki, Aquaman, you name it, he's worked on it. He is a superb artist, a great friend. Martin Mercer, welcome to Double Feature. Thank you, Steve. Lovely to be here. See, I knew that that accent wasn't from Texas. That's definitely a British accent. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, you're here? Now, you're in Los Angeles, right? Um, uh, I'm sure you're working away on another production, and I want to thank you for uh, taking the time away. Um, but, Martin, you and I met about 25, maybe 30 years ago. Uh, yeah. But I know your career started when you were 18. I think you started working at Pinewood Studios, right? Well, when I was 18, I am... Um... Uh, in school in the UK, you, you can stay on to the sixth form and then you go on to college. Um, and I was going to go to art college, but I had an opportunity to work on the film Labyrinth, which was a Jim Henson uh, production and had David Bowie in it. And at the time, my dear friend, uh, his father was George Gibbs. George Gibbs, unfortunately, has passed away a few years ago, but he was a mechanical effects supervisor. And he'd done Indiana Jones and Brazil and, and just a whole load of films. And he kind of took me under his wing. And so he offered me a role as a trainee T-boy on Labyrinth in the mechanical effects department. And that was at Elstree Studios, oh, Elstree. which is in Portland Wood, yeah. And Elstree is where they did the Indiana Jones 3, The Last Crusade. And I know you worked on that rat sequence, right? Didn't you work on the yeah. the the... the the rats that were on fire in the water underneath Venice. Yes. This was before CG and any of that type of work. So everything had to be made. And the rats, uh, we had a guy called Dave Shiguri, who was a very clever foam specialist. And he made the bodies of the rats. And then we haired them. We actually put fur on them. And uh, we had uh, a little rudder underneath and a propeller, which was driven by an elastic band. You would and wind so, them up, right? You would wind them up? Yes. Yes, we would all wind them up with uh, electric drills and they would be on this frame, which was on a track under the water. And so uh, when the director, Mr. Steven Spielberg, said action, uh, we would pull this uh, trolley underwater and all the rats would be moving like that, you see, moving through the water. And at the same time, we had a couple of guys with uh, long rods with a butane uh, on fire and they would that would go to a butane tank and on action they would release the valve and you get this big ball of fire because that was what was driving the rats. And, of course, Indy dives underneath the coffin uh, to prevent from getting burnt. Right, and they use the real rats for the close-ups of Indy underneath, and so those rats would funnel into the... Uh, those were real rats that so would go on the actors, but then those wide shots were were those mechanical rats that you guys well, created, so nothing, uh, the, none of the animals got hurt. Well, the, the wide shots were mechanical, but also we did have real rats. There was a gentleman called Mike Cullen who provided all the animals. He was an animal expert. And um, so the rats uh, were placed in the set in amongst the skeletons and everything. And of course, over the time, they would multiply, which is the, what they did. So the rats actually multiplied and uh, our mechanical ones did the water stuff and the real rats were swimming in the water. And also uh, Mr. Spielberg was like, well, well, I need more rats. I need more rats on the walls. So we would end up nailing these rubber rats to the all over the walls. We would just have to cover the walls. And so when they moved the lights and you had the flame, it looked like the moving. rats were moving, yeah, right. on the wall. How, how what a what a first experience for a young person in in, uh, in Britain. That must have been amazing to you. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was Harrison Ford, he was very pleasant. He would go, call me H, you know, guys, just call me H. Yeah. And he would go into his trailer and just, it was a very friendly guy, very nice. And how was it when you first saw the movie um, on the big screen after all your work was done? 
Um, well, it was very exciting because they always have the premieres, or I didn't go to the premiere, but they have the crew screening and the premieres. I have them in Leicester Square, which is the main theatrical sort of district in London. And so that was fun to go there on Sunday and everybody's lining up and going and see it. I was a little bit disappointed because I didn't get a credit. Oh. Uh, but George said, yeah, sorry, Mark, I didn't have any room. So I was a little bit bummed at that. But uh, nonetheless, it was great to see see it all come together. You know, it's interesting, Martin, I was talking to a film historian the other day and uh, we were talking about credits and all and how back in the day, you know, a film like Jaws wouldn't have that many credits. Um, and uh, actually, I was talking to Joe Alves and, and he was talking about credits and how on certain films that he had worked on, he wouldn't get credited. And then as time has gone on, you know, more and more, whether it's through the unions, more and more folks are getting the, the well-deserved credits. Um, but back in the day, it would be one credit for art director and, and no one who did storyboards or anything would get credits. And so, like, thankfully now you're, you're getting the, the recognition you deserve. Um, so was it at Elstree or, or, or Pinewood uh, in England, which... Uh, where, when you met Clive Barker, uh, because I know Clive Barker, he was a, a, a writer of horror, um, and he had an impact on your career, correct? Correct. So, I mean, Clive um, first came to prominence with a series of books called The Books of Blood, and um, uh, Stephen King uh, saying, I've seen, his quote was, I've seen the future of horror, and its name is Clive Barker. And, of course, once you get a quote from Stephen King, who is the god of horror, right? Once yep. you get a quote from him saying that your career is on the up and up, and Clive wrote those books, and they're amazing books even to, to, to this day. And he had a deal uh, with, uh, I think it was New World Pictures at the time, and uh, they allowed him to uh, direct Hellraiser. Uh, Robin Vigeon was the DOP, Director of Photography, and uh, for a, I think it was a very small uh, fee for Clive and he had to sell his rights as well. But nonetheless, he got to direct Hellraiser and that was a massive hit and um, it was beautifully photographed and it became very well known for the uh, Cenobite characters. The Pinhead, uh, right? The, Pinhead? Yeah, he was known as the lead Cenobite at the time, but he became recognised as Pinhead, which was played by the actor Doug Bradley. And um, you had... Um, those three main characters and uh he became you know very well known for those and the film did really well and so then clive got a deal to uh direct his film uh cabal which uh, became nightbreed right. um and anyway so i'd i'd seen a hellraiser i was like oh i'd love to work for those people um and at the time i was working model making um and set building at the time uh, for a company in london called asylum models and effects so um i was like oh i wonder how i could get involved there and um i'd heard that they were going to be doing uh nightbreed a couple of model makers told me yeah we're going up to pine we're going to work for a company called image animation mm -hmm. so i found image animation and i phoned them up and i managed to get an interview and my dad blessing me drove me up there to pine which was about 30 miles away and I interviewed there, showed them my portfolio. And I was one of the few people back then that actually had worked on proper films. Yeah. Most of the guys that got there had been, like me, had been doing it in their rooms at home and just, you know, fans. Um, and anyway, so I managed to get uh, an interview and they said, yeah, OK, well, keep calling, keep calling. We're not sure when we're going to start. So for eight weeks, every week, I rang them up. I rang up a guy called Jeff Portas, who was the uh, second in command there. Bob Keane owned the company. And um, eventually I got hired as a sculptor, background sculptor. Wow. And uh, who does, do you know who designed the Pinhead character? Was that Clive himself or did somebody do that character? No, no, Clive was an excellent artist. I oh. mean, if you are able to see the original Books of Blood covers, he illustrated those. Um, I actually have one here over there, but he, he illustrated it. He's a phenomenal artist. Yeah. And so all the characters you see in Nightbreed, he designed. And so we would get these sketches 
and you had the main creature guys who who were there: Steve Painter, Neil Gordon, Paul Jones, Mark Coulier, who was an Oscar winner, Paul Spitzeri, who just won a, an Emmy for The Last of Us. Uh, all these guys were there, and they sculpted and made the stuff, and and as I did myself. And who is your? Did you have a mentor at that time? Well, my mentor was uh, George Gibbs, and so I was still in contact with George. And actually, uh, when I was at Pinewood, Alien 3 was about to start, and George said, oh, Martin, I've got you an interview there. So I went up. I didn't get the job, but nonetheless, it was nice to meet the guys. But, yeah, so I, I still knew George then. But then, you know, Clive was really cool. He was very approachable. He would come into the workshop and um and he he could see i like drawing and so he actually uh, allowed me to do three covers for the marvel comics at the time did the nightbreed versions so he got me a, a job doing a couple of covers you know they're okay now but uh but it was great for him to and, do and, that. And, and it also uh gave you confidence i'm sure that 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 your work was being uh well received right yeah, no, it was very nice to have that because you always, I mean, especially us Brits, you know, we're not very confident of ourselves, really, a bit shy. So, sure, sure. You know, it's nice to get a boost. And, and you're starting out. And so then, uh, was it that you went from Nightbreed to Lord of Illusions and came out to Los Angeles? Was that the, was that the transition? Yeah, the transition happened because our company, Image Animation, which was Bob Keane and Jeff Fortas's company, and we were the main crew by that time, we were doing all these movies like Warlock, Warlock 2, Hellraiser 2, Hellraiser 3, um, Candyman, the original Candyman. So we did, all, and all these films were being, they weren't being done in Europe and the, U, and the UK like they are now. They were all being done in America, in Los Angeles mostly. Right. And so Bob decided to move part of the company to Los Angeles. So I came out and looked for a workshop and was one of the people that started it. And um, when he started Lord of Illusions, the actual work that our company was doing wasn't a lot. He was dividing it amongst other people like Steve Johnson, XFX at the time, and, and Tony Gardner and all these other guys who were amazing artists. Um, and so our work wasn't much. And I remember we were having a meeting and Clive said, oh, I, I need storyboards. I need somebody to do storyboards. And I just put my hand up and said, I'll do them, Clive. And because um, I... I fancied a change, you know, because makeup effects, especially back then, was very messy and dirty. It's not very good for the skin and so on right. and so forth. So I fancied a change. And you hadn't um, done, you hadn't few... done, you hadn't done storyboards yet, right? No, I'd, I'd done, when we did makeup effects, we had to design the shots to show the directors how to shoot these puppets and so on and so forth. So I had a little bit of experience, but it, no, not really. Right. I'd read a magazine. Um, <laughs> You know, also <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's great. So, so you did. So you you did storyboards for Lord of Illusions. Yes, I um would drive to Clive's house in Beverly Hills every day, and Clive had a couple of houses because he was doing quite well by then, and one of them was his art studio. So I'd drive up to his house, park there, and go into his studio. And there was another artist there called Mark Baird. And Mark Baird is an amazing artist, and we became friends. Um, and uh, yeah, for six months, literally just sat in Clive's house and drew the boards. And Clive would do the storyboards. Clive would get up every day and write for two hours, and then he would do his drawings and that. So he he was very dedicated to what he did. He deserves all his success, worked very hard. He comes from Liverpool, um, very poor background, so he did really well. Yep. Now, when you would be drawing, I remember, because you and I worked on a few projects together, you listened to a lot of techno music at the time. When you were working with Clive, would you have music on uh, or would you would you draw without music? No music. No music. No. No. Yeah. Because yeah. it was me what, and Mark in the, in your, the room there. Yeah. So would, we were just talk to each other and just discuss the scene or Clive would come in. So no, no music. Okay. Do you prefer to draw with music on or do you prefer <clears throat> no music? No, I, I because I, I have tinsonitis, ringing ears. So it's actually better for me to just not listen to anything and just focus 
on the work. Other guys, they they can have movies on and all. I don't know how they do it. I, I can't do that. I have to just look at what I'm doing and get on with it. Because I, I know when I'm sometimes working on my screenplays, and that's how I made my living before, I would always have music on. That yeah. is, kept, I don't know, it kept me going all the time. Um, Martin, so you're, yeah, I mean, you've won awards. So we're going to jump around a little bit. Okay. So recently you won, uh, let's see, in 2022, you won the Art Directors Guild Production Design Award for the TV series Loki. Uh, the episode is called Glorious Purpose, correct? Mm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and, 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 and where you where you are now and then we'll go back uh, we'll, we'll do a we'll little we'll do almost like a memento uh, style of interview <laughs> yeah. right. without the ending over right, right. <laughs> um, yeah um, well Loki was great because um, my dear friend Darren Dellinger who is uh, an exceptional story artist and animatics specialist animatics is where you animate the boards all together. So you're literally looking at an animated film and he, he'd worked for Marvel for years. And so they always would say to him, Oh, we, you know, we need the, uh, an artist for this. And he recommended me for Loki. And so I went up to Disney and uh, that's who owns Marvel and Marvel was in the Disney building. And uh, I interviewed there and uh, there was one interview and I got through that. And then I'm, met the interview and then went to another interview which was by phone where i spoke to the director who's a british director kate heron mm -hmm. and she directed before that a show called sex education which is very funny yeah um and um she she directed some episodes of that and anyway she pitched her view of loki and she got the job and it was all very exciting and so i interviewed with her on the phone we got on very well and then i went to disney again and met her there and it was being done in atlanta and these days you can do everything online so i didn't have to go to atlanta so basically kate would prep and give me shot lists every director is different some mm -hmm. do shot lists some draw pictures like ridley scott ridley grams mm -hmm. and some don't you know they let you get on with it and then they look at what you've done and make their changes yep. um so kate was very judicious in having lists of shot lists and so that's how we started and we started with a scene on the the train Lockie gets on the train and all this stuff happens and it was a huge sequence actually as things do they got changed and cut down um and uh, that's basically what happened there now during that show covid19 really started to ravage uh, across the country and the world and they were still shooting and what they had to do uh they had to actually keep me on all through that period because now it became a case of right well we've got six actors in a room but we've got to keep them six foot apart how do we shoot that and and so anyway so we they use my boards to determine how they would shoot that and the angles and wow. so that was a good show it kept me going through covid fortunately wow um when you were going to have your interview with her kate um did you know who you were going to be who's going to interview you and then did you see those uh those programs sex education so you were prepared uh to know her work or had you not done that no, because um, I didn't know okay. who the director was. They didn't tell me. Yeah. Of course, once I'd met her on the phone, spoke to her on the phone, I I then looked her up, and obviously, so and I'd seen sex sex education already. So once I knew she was on that, and I just looked up the episodes that she directed, just to see, oh, what did she need boarding? And there was one episode where somebody's on a bike and they go down a hill and they have an accident and that. And so. You know, so that's what I, I always do my research best yeah. I can. Let me ask you this, something. This is a this is a, a unique question. You've worked with a lot of. I mean, I don't know how many shows you've done, uh, movies, TV shows. You've done everything from, you know, video games like uh, Twisted Metal Black. You've done comedies. You've done. You've worked with every different director and actor in fantasy. When you're storyboarding, a, a, a Let's say it's a Ridley Scott film 
or in this case it was K. And let's say you're somewhat familiar with their work. Or Do you, when you storyboard, do you try to think like them or are you just thinking like yourself? Are you just, are you saying this is how I would do it or this is how I think, knowing how they like to move the camera, this is maybe how I think they would want to do Like, do you almost become like a, an actor in a way? Um, what happens, it varies because like the thing I'm doing now, just doing a project with reshoots, um, I've been able to look at what they've shot and therefore I can see how that director moves a camera. And therefore, when I board, I think, okay, I've I've seen, okay, they like tracking shots and then they like leading in from one foreground object into a distant object. So that goes into my brain. But a lot of the times, look, this job is about servicing a vision in order to um, get the whole crew on board with what needs to be seen and what needs to be done. That's what it is, basically. It's like doing a map. That's how I see it. Yeah. Um, so I'm not directing. However, what does happen is a lot of the stuff when I'm given a scene and it's like, well, here's the script, have a crack at it. I just go by instinct. Now, touch wood, knocking on the old head there, um, it seems to work. Mm -hmm. Most of the times when I've gone by instinct, it has been received well. Um, when I look at the films at the end, there are I can see, oh, look, okay, I can see my sh my shot in there, you know, the right. one that I drew. And obviously, you know, that goes through all the processes. And in the end, the director looks at that and it's his or her call, you know. Right, right. Um, you also love to do um, concept art, right? You've done some really neat concept art. Uh, is that sometimes more enjoyable than storyboards? Um, well, most of the concept art came from the fact that I because I used to do makeup effects. So I had some friends who were working on shows and they needed some some images. And and so I would do those. And I have to, a couple of films I've done conceptual art for as a whole, such as um, the uh, Paranormal Activity, yeah. uh, the fifth the fifth version of that. Uh, that was all concept art, didn't do any boards. But um I actually do enjoy doing boards more, to be honest with you. Oh. And and also conceptual art now with artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, it's days, uh, yeah, they're kind of numbered in a way. So I'm glad I do boards. And even that's going to be affected by it, right. that's for sure. When, when you did um, the TV series uh, Star Trek Discovery, you were what were you doing, designing costumes? What happened for that was uh, my friend Paul Jones did the first series, just series one, and they needed some concepts sort of background aliens and also uh, Demter, I think her name was. She had a control device here. Yes. So Paul engaged me to design that. We had to do it very quickly. We spent a whole weekend using our phones, texting and drawing. Um, I did some concept art for that and the background aliens. So, and con costume wise, yeah, I did about a month on that as well for the first series, Costume Designer. Wow. Um, let me ask you, because when you and I met about 25, 30 years ago, you were doing, all of the work was pencil, right? It was pretty yeah. much pencil work. And then I remember there was a concern you had because the storyboard tools were starting to evolve and getting... You're doing more on the computer and you're taking mm. classes. And can you talk about the evolution of, of how you started and how it's evolved over time and some of the tools of the trade? Because there might be some folks who are watching tonight that are phenomenal artists and are interested in becoming storyboard artists. What are some of the tools that you now need and how is, how is things evolved and how have you become more educated right well when i started um everything was pencils markers pens i i worked on a show called asteroid which was for nbc and that was i would 
draw it out in pencil, go to um, Kinko's at the time, yes. the colour copy service. As you know, we did loads of your stuff there. And um, I would photocopy it. So then you would have a black line that was indelible. And then with coloured pencils and markers, you would go over that and you would use colour to bring it, you know, create the illustration. Um, it all started to change for me when I worked on Twisted Metal Black for Sony Computer Entertainment. Um, and there, for the first time, I saw this tool called Photoshop. And, um, you know, that's, I, I didn't even know how to scan an image. They had to teach me and how to scan and then colour in Photoshop. But even actually on Twisted Metal Black, most of my stuff was done um, using markers and pen, as it happens. But that was the first introduction to it. And I then worked on a show called Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and I was on that for about a year and a half. That was Brad that, Pitt. That was the Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie film. Yeah, directed by Doug Lyman. Right, who, and, had, done, who had done the um, Born Identity. Yes, yes, that's right. And um, so uh, Doug, you know, wanted to read loads of storyboards. And there was another artist, unfortunately, I've forgotten the guy's name, but he was very good. And he he was doing all his stuff digitally. So I was like, oh, you know, so and, and actually my friend Mark Baird, who uh, was working on Daredevil and, and I did a few weeks on Daredevil and he was totally digital. He was using what they call a Wacom tablet, uh, which is a tablet and you know you have a pen and and back then that was really eye-opening oh. so it was a, an evolution where i just i forced myself to okay i gotta get a computer so i brought an apple computer bloody expensive at the time and a tablet and i just forced myself to you know to do this and um actually a lot of the older artists in the industry at the time were really bucking at it and just a lot of them retired and, and just didn't want to know. Um, but what could you do? You know, I wasn't retirement age, so I just plowed through with it. And over time, uh, one of the ways I do, I would I keep sketchbooks, you see. I keep sketchbooks like this, loads of sketchbooks. And I would use a pen, basically, because it was very similar to the electronic stylus. It was, you know, hard and unforgiving in that way. That's how I trained myself. You so you needed something tactile. What's up? You needed something tactile. You needed that yeah. physical property. Yeah, because when you you know with the iPad, this is the iPad, and you got the stylus. You know, it's very plastic on plastic. And when you draw with a pencil, you know, it's it's not like that. It's it's giving and it's soft, and you can feel it biting into the paper. We don't get that with digital work. Right, right, right. And I remember at the time you were a little nervous because you knew that there was going to be. You, you had to climb a mountain to, to, to really rediscover uh, these new tools or discover these new tools. And I, I remember it was a, it was a little yeah. scary because you were jumping in, you know, into the big pool, yeah. right? The deep end. And I did take classes as well at our union, um, which was the Art Directors Guild, IATSE. Uh, they did provide classes at Valley Village College. Valley Village College. Mm -hmm. And so um, we... Um, I, I did Photoshop, I did After Effects, and I just, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree, so it was hard work to try and uh, get this stuff. But I managed to scrape by. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> at this time, Martin, when you're doing all of this and you're evolving and, and uh, gaining all this knowledge, is that when you're doing X-Files or had you done X-Files already? Uh, X Files was just I, I again. It was just pen on paper. Oh. All my stuff was pen on paper and marker. I hadn't gone digital at all then. No. Yep. And then one of the you also did uh, Iron Man three is another film you did and Silent Hill. Can you talk a little bit about working on those on those shows? Well, Iron Man three literally. Um, my friend Jim Magladino, who's a excellent artist, he. He he couldn't do it for a few weeks. He was some family troubles and things. So he got me on there for two weeks. So I just did two weeks on it. And um, and that was fine. It was very rushed. And, you know, I just had to do what I was told. And that I did that. And that was the end of that. <laughs> and then Silent Hill. 
Now, Simon and Hill was a lot of fun because um, I'd met Roger Avery and we actually developed quite a friendship and I would hang out with him and he had all these projects he wanted to do. And so I would do all this stuff. And he wrote the first Silent Hill. He was due to direct the second one. So I initially started with him doing designs um, for Pyramid Head, who is the guy with the big, huge pyramid and the sword. One of the ideas we actually wanted to see what's inside Pyramid Head when he takes off his mask. Mm -hmm. So I did loads of concepts for that. And then eventually Roger didn't do it. There was another director whose name, unfortunately, I've forgotten, Michael, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so he did it. And I worked with him doing conceptual illustrations based on a new character, this uh, woman with two bladed hands and spiked heels and stuff. So that was quite fun. I think I tonight. dated her. I think I might have dated her. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask you, you, uh, you also got nominated uh, by the Art Directors Guild for Mal Maleficent. Maleficent. Yes. Uh, Mal Maleficent 2. Maleficent 2. Can you talk about that and, and, and what that project was like and how you got involved? And, and, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the director of that was Rowan Yoakum. And uh, he is, I believe, a Swedish director. He'd done... Uh, the, uh, one of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and so I met with him at the Hotel Maramont, in, uh, which is a sort of a place where all the stars Chateau, go. Chateau Maramont. That's it. That's the one. Thank you. Um, and so I went there and met with him and we had a coffee and he said, right, I need this opening sequence. Here's the script. Off you go. Can you have it done by Friday? So uh, I went back to the studio at Disney and worked on it and then went back to the to the hotel and presented it with him. And he goes, okay, great, straight on to Previs. Now what Previs is, it's a 3D computer rendition of a sequence. Usually we provide the storyboard ideas first and then Previs guys, they then take that and carry that away. Now they might not like me saying that, but that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, they took that and they made the Previs rendering from it. Um, and then he he went off and had to deal with casting and so on and so forth. And so then I, as a lot of times happens, you deal with the visual effects studios. And so I was dealing with them and boarding various sequences. And that was about for three months. And then they said, OK, we're, we're, we're moving to the UK now. So we're, we're going to shoot the rest of it there. So thank you very much. So that was the end of my role on it there. But it's very strange to think, oh, OK, going back to my home country, um, but I can't, you don't want me to work on it. So that was quite fun. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah. And um, how how did you feel like when you saw the final uh, product of that? Because um, yeah, you got nominated was... for it. I mean, you got nominated for that work. Well, I, what happens is, is when you get nominated for that work for the Art, art Directors Guild, is they, it's the production designer and their team. And right. so I, I was, uh, Patrick Totopoulos was the production designer for that. And so I was part of his team. So what happens is, is in the nominations, you get Patrick and then you get a concept guys and you get storyboard guys. So yeah, it was, it was not always nice to have that, you know, a little bit of recognition fluttering down to yeah. where we are. Now I remember, <laughs> I remember when you got this gig because you know how much of a huge fan I am when you got the Planet of the Apes gig. Uh, well, what was it like working on the Planet of the Apes movies? The, the well, uh, when we, Rise. Yeah, the Rise of the Apes. Um, well, when it was, when we were engaged to do it, it was a pitch. So our boards were being used to present to the studio and say, hey, guys, you know, do you want to do this? You know, Planet of the Apes, brilliant movie with Charlton Heston. We all love that classic. Sure. And the subsequent series. Um and they were so we were doing pitch boards, and whilst we were doing the pitch boards, uh, it was like, "Hey, you're a green. You've got the green light. You're a go." So that was quite exciting. And again, worked with the director. Uh, he had a quite a strong vision of what he wanted, and so um, I remember I did a scene in Muir, Muir Park, I think, uh, in San Francisco, where the apes are hiding in the trees and, yeah. and so on and so forth. So that was that was quite fun, because I do love Planet of the Apes. Uh, very, Did, didn't very you fun. also do the sequence on the bridge? Uh, I, a little bit, but mainly uh, it was when they went to Africa and they poached the apes from there and just many different bits and pieces. 
You're right. Um, that was a treat. And then you've worked on Aquaman and the sequel of Aquaman. Uh, can you talk about what those experiences have been like for you? Yeah, they were great fun because I was always a fan of the director, James Wan, because I remember going to a screening of Saw, which was his first massive hit. You know, he'd come from Australia. This film was made for like under a million dollars and it was a huge hit. And so he was doing a talk at the theatre where they showed Saw. So I was like, oh, he's really cool. You know, he's very young, very cool. Yep. Um, anyway, so I managed uh, my friend James Doe, who works with James Wan a lot. James Doe is a storyboard guy and he said, oh, mine, they're looking for somebody else. So I'll put your name in. And so I went for an interview. I met James Wan and his office was filled with maquettes and models and all the cool designs from Aquaman. I was like, and I just felt like, you know, when I was uh, 18 again, right. you know what I mean? Yep. I was just so into it. So I, hopefully he saw some of that enthusiasm and I got hired. And uh, my main sequence was the arena fight between Orm and Aquaman. And um, and then James again was like, look, I, I like wide shots. I, I like my action in wide and just just run with it. And so I'd started to run with it. And then James would come round and look and say, well, can you do this? Can you do that? And so we developed that um, that scene. And, you know, I might have an idea. Like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if they started running on the shield of one of the big statues? And he was like, yeah, OK, that's good. Let's do that. And. So that was very enjoyable, yeah. And I worked at Warner Brothers in Burbank on that and that for about six, seven months. Now, would they pre-vis that, uh, your work on that afterwards and, and, yeah. and take it to yeah. the next level? Yeah. And yeah. Are, you, are you part of that process or does it uh, just leave your hands? And then or do you see it? Do you, do you have any input on that? No, the um the our job is to map it out, yep. and then the previous guys they build all the assets, and then when they have the board and they they can see the direction, and now when the previous guys work, and they might go oh, or the you know James might go okay, well we should do it on a a fifty here, fifty mil lens, and so previous can do that. They can show you what a fifty mil lens looks like, and so on, and oh we're going to have him on a flying rig here, and previous can put the rig in and. So that, I don't have anything to do with that. My thing is I provide, here's the map, and then those guys run with it with the director. Arn, you've, you've recently worked on, uh, uh, I believe it's Bad Boys 4. Um, Correct. How has that experience been working on Bad Boys 4, the, 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 the newest sequel of the movie? Yeah, it was, really, it was really good fun. It was a very kind of accelerated production the guys uh, the two directors and the director of photography were from belgium and um they had some issues with the third act as you know that happens quite a lot in productions usually the third act and so they wanted some some ideas basically of how to do certain scenes and so they engaged me and straight away it was right in there usually on the first day, you you can just relax and just read the script and do your paperwork. But this time it was like, no, we need this. And can we have it by the end of the day? But it was a challenge and they were very nice. And uh, I was on it for about 10 weeks and they were happy with what was done. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. It should be fun. Was that filmed in Florida? Or was that filmed in Los Angeles or, or where was that? I think that was filmed in Atlanta Okay, and, and some stuff in Miami and yeah, I believe. I didn't go on location, but what was nice was the guys actually sent me a photo of my boards all laid out oh. on the set, because and they tick them off, you see. They strike them off as they go through them, so that was fun. Right, right, right. Um, is yeah. there? Can you share what you're working on now, Martin, or, or is that top secret? Um, no, I, I can't really reveal the title, but it's it's um, it's science fiction horror and uh, it's reshoots. It was reshoots. It was made in London. Yep. But they're doing some reshoots, and uh, yeah, it should be cool. Very exciting to be mm. involved in this one. Now, now, do you have a particular genre you love to work in, or or not? No, I, I like horror. I mean, I love horror, science fiction action um adventure but you know i mean even comedy i did a film called mall cop 2 and and it was a lot of fun you know it was a lot of fun it's actually quite a fun film um and there was loads of gags in there so 
you know, as long as it's action and it's, uh, you know, using the brain to work out sequences, I'm quite yeah. happy to do it. Yep. And what else are you working on? Are you working on any of your own stuff right now? Um, well, I, I do have my podcast. <laughs> yes. Tell us about it. Um, now, um, that's called The Wrong Side of Hollywood. And uh, it, it, it's quite, it's very English and it's very cynical and bitter and grumbly and twisted, but all in a very lighthearted Monty Python-esque, the full Monty without the striptease manner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and as, as with my mate, James, who you know, yep. James Nastriani, we've known each other since we're kids. And so because we came from England, we moved here, we've ended up living li literally next door to each other. And during the pandemic and the downtime, you know, we have such a, a good rapport with each other. We thought, how can we video and then somebody said well why don't you do a podcast so we started to do that where we would describe our adventures of being foreigners mm -hmm. in america in california and los angeles we describe british food and our experiences of food in california and we would interview people what i would call in the trenches i.e people who don't get the limelight so much like voiceover actors we interviewed uh somebody who worked on all the big effects films in the 80s so so that's that's a kind of side project um i've been working on and, and his um, brother his brother one of your podcasts his brother directed the play about uh jaws um yes. what is it called the shark is working is that what the name of the play is called the the shark is broken. Is broken, right? And um, and Guy Masterson, he directed it, and it was written by Robert Shaw's son. Yes. And um, and he Robert Shaw had kept diaries during the making of Jaws, and um, and his son decided to do a, a write a play from it, and it, it it was in London, and it went on to Broadway. Right. Um, and Guy, yeah, Guy directed it and guy is james's brother and another thing with james is his uncle was none other than richard burton wow richard burton yeah. the richard burton the richard burton yeah, yes pretty. well it's really neat because we had as you know we had joe alves here um at the uh, double feature and uh uh so it's kind of neat how how um you know that story's come around and and we try to get uh, to Martha's Vineyard. They always have these different um, uh, anniversaries, you know, a Jaws yes. Fest. So um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that play. But I want to say my brother from another mother, my British brother, Martin, I want to thank you so much for taking time. I know you've got a lot going on, a very busy schedule. And I want to thank you for your your super talent, your friendship, the love, your passion at what you do, and um, and for educating the audience and then giving our audience an opportunity to see some of your artwork um, tonight on this show. So I want to wish you the very best of health and continued success, and I look forward to seeing you soon and maybe having you back on if you enjoyed your experience here. I'd be delighted, and um, you are absolutely fabulous. I think Rhode Island is extremely lucky to have you. You've always talked about Rhode Island. You've always, when we first met, and I think you've done an am amazing job and very inspiring. Um, yeah, so totally a brother to me, and uh, I really appreciate your friendship, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, pal. And I hope everybody listens to your podcast as well. What's it called? It's called The Wrong Side of Hollywood, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, it, I hope it doesn't insult anybody, but it's just a laugh. It's just <laughs> right. fun. You're doing it for fun. And your artwork, is, uh, uh, we'll be showing some of that as well. Thank you, pal. Oh, thank you. Lots of love. Cheers, Dave. Love you, mate. Yep.